someone so unforgettable thinks that I am unforgettable too.
Do 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 do
remain standing for the reading of God's Word. We're in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, and verses 24 to 29, my favorite passages in the New Testament. Before we hear God's Word, let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, faith is hard. It's hard to believe what we cannot see. So teach us from your word this morning, and thank you, thank you, thank you for including this in your word so that we may, might have eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. John 20, beginning at verse 24, this is God's holy, inspired, and therefore inerrant word. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of the living God will stand forever and ever. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. I've been rereading my favorite book by the great Christian author and apologist C.S. Lewis. Imagine most of us know him for the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the Chronicles of Narnia series, and maybe even his book, Mere Christianity. My favorite book by him is his book simply titled Miracles. And as I was reading that this week and thinking about what we're talking about this morning, here's the question that all of us need to answer here. And you will answer it one way or the other. Did the resurrection really happen? really happened as in could be reported in a newspaper, happened in space-time history? That's the greatest question any of us will ever ask. And Lewis wrote a book, this book Miracles, about that very question. And he opens it with a very interesting story. And if you grasp his main point, it will change everything for you. He opens with a story about a friend of his who claimed she saw a ghost. And here's what he wrote about that. Quote, the interesting thing about the story is that the person disbelieved in the immortal soul before she saw the ghost and still disbelieves after seeing it, close quote. Here's what he's saying. This woman he knew who claimed she'd seen a ghost did not believe that life continued after death. She did not believe we had a soul. She was an atheist. And she saw a ghost, she claimed, and even with that sight evidence, still didn't believe. Here's what Lewis says, quote, what we learn from experience, this is so important, depends on the kind of philosophy we bring to experience. Seeing is not believing, close quote. What we believe about experience depends upon the kind of philosophy we bring to experience. And that's why we come to this story about Thomas this morning. He was so much like us. He's one of my heroes in the New Testament. One author has said that Thomas could be called the loyal skeptic. Don't you love when you read about him, especially in John's Gospel? You go back to chapter 11, verse 19, when Jesus was on his way to Bethany to raise Lazarus from the dead. There was great danger awaiting for him. The Jews were ready to kill him. And here's what Thomas says, let's go down with him that we might die also. 
Now, a lot of times when that's read or preached, it's read as if Thomas is kind of a cynic. Well, let's go. Might as well. That's not the way it comes across at all. Just the opposite, in fact. Actually, Thomas is the only one of the apostles who stands up and says, if Jesus dies, let's do this. I'm going with him. He's loyal, but he's a skeptic. And he's still skeptical a week after the first Easter morning. That's where we meet him this morning. Why was he skeptical? Because even 2,000 years ago, he, even though he was a religious Jewish man, had the wrong philosophy of experience. Like so many skeptics today, and I say that as a former skeptic myself. And here's something else about this scene that I think is so marvelous, so fascinating. Just prior to this account that we read, Jesus appears to them on the evening of the first Easter, and he breathes on them. You ever wonder why he did that? And, and there's a deep purpose to it. John's gospel begins and ends with the book of Genesis. The book, book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, the first words of the Bible are, in the beginning God created. The first words of this gospel are, in the beginning was the Word. Then in Genesis 2, when God makes man, he breathes on him to make him a living soul. And so Jesus, here at the end of this gospel, after his resurrection, breathes on the disciples. Why? Remember, they were all Jewish people. They knew their Bibles well. This would not have been lost on them. He is saying to them, through your message, through your witness, you are the new humanity. You are the perfection of everything created because of what I've done in my death and resurrection. The new creation has come partially in me. That's what Jesus is telling them. But Thomas wasn't there. He wasn't there that first Easter evening. Now he is. And here's what I want us to see from this text this morning. We learn and receive the blessing of walking by faith when we see skepticism's resolution contrasted with Jesus's benediction in this passage. There's a contrast. There's a resolute skepticism about Thomas, isn't there? A firmness about it. And that's contrasted with this benediction, this blessing that Jesus pronounces upon them and upon us. So those will be our two headings this morning. Skepticism's resolution and Jesus's benediction. First of all then, skepticism's resolution. Now think about this. Here's the way it's often painted if you read um, unbelieving literature about why the resurrection didn't happen, why miracles can't happen, why Christianity can't possibly be true. One of the arguments is, well, these were ancient, pre-modern, pre-scientific people. They, of course, believed in things like miracles and resurrections, but we, living in the scientific age, know better now. My friends, Thomas here shows us the absolute falsity of that argument. Thomas knew, like you and I know, that it's not ordinary if you go to a morgue to find people rising from the dead. And Thomas, like us, had a faith in unbelief. That's what's happening in our world today. Don't, don't buy into this dichotomy that's so often presented that you've got scientific fact on one side and religious faith on the other side, and never the two shall meet. Science is real. Religion is wishful thinking. That's the way it's presented today. That's not at all the way it really is. Unbelief is a faith all its own. It's a faith that requires belief in things that cannot be proven by the scientific method. In fact, the scientific method itself rests on principles which have to be taken on faith. So Thomas is a whole lot more like us, and his faith of unbelief, if we could put it like that, teaches us two things about skepticism. First, skepticism is resolute because it's never satisfied. I want you to stop and think about this. Who is telling Thomas that Jesus is alive in this passage? His ten closest friends, who he spent the better part of three years with, waking, sleeping, 
eating, drinking, traveling around with. Now, I don't know about you, but if one of my closest friends came to me and told me something that seemed unbelievable at first, my default setting would be to trust him because I know him. I believe him intrinsically. If 10 of my best friends came to me and said that, my ears would perk up. We're geared that way, aren't we? And yet here's Thomas with his closest friend saying to him, Jesus is alive, and what does Thomas say? Unless I place, twice he says that, unless I place my hands in the nail marks, unless I place my hands in his sides, and unless I see, I will never believe. So skepticism is resolute and never satisfied, and it is also always believing that sight is superior to faith. But here's the irony, isn't it? Isn't there some irony here? Think about who's saying this. If you, if you know anything about the New Testament, Jesus sent out his apostles to perform miracles, and they did. Thomas had been there when Jesus fed the 5,000, when Jesus turned the water into wine, when he came stepping across the stormy seas of Galilee in the middle of the night, Thomas was in the boat. He'd seen the miracles of Jesus. He would performed miracles himself. This is a guy who had everything presented to him on a silver platter, as it were, for faith. He'd seen miracles. He'd done miracles. That wasn't enough. And that's because when it all was said and done, he had a faith in unbelief that was resolute. Now, here's what happens to Thomas and to us. Here's what unbelief always does. It says, show me, when it should just sit down and say, let me listen. That's what Thomas had to learn. That's what we're going to have to learn. And consider how modern this story is, my friends. There's all kinds of books out there and articles, especially this time of year. You can guarantee uh, any major newspaper, any news feed you read, anything you scroll through on Instagram or X, you'll find an article written by a prominent Bible scholar that tells you 15 reasons why the resurrection could not have happened. Skepticism is very much alive. And you see, here's what we have to realize. The problem is not the evidence. Thomas had all the evidence in the world. And by the way, the evidence for the resurrection I just got a new book. We've been on vacation. I came back and I ordered this book, volume one of four, 800 pages by probably the world's leading expert on the resurrection of Jesus on why the resurrection happened. So probably 3,200 pages he's got of evidence, okay? Big, fat, thick book. All kinds of evidence. Problem is not the evidence. I remember hearing a history professor once saying, after reading through the evidence for Jesus, this man was a prominent historian he said, there's no doubt in my mind he is raised from the dead. Absolutely incontrovertible evidence. The most well-attested historical fact in history. That was this learned professor's conclusion. This apologist who was interviewing him said, well, do you believe in Jesus? He said, of course not. Why? He knew the evidence. He said it was all true. Why didn't he believe? Precisely because of what C.S. Lewis said. Seeing is not believing. It's not the problem of the evidence. The problem with Thomas, the problem with us, is the unbelief in our hearts that leads us to have a philosophy of life that will not let the evidence in. Plenty of evidence, not the problem. The problem is within us. But the question also is, why did Thomas not believe? If the evidence was so strong, True, he had the wrong philosophy of life, but I think there's something more human about this. I don't think it was just purely logical. I don't think it is for you if you're a skeptic here this morning. Maybe you find yourself in the same place Thomas did. You're afraid of being let down. I think that's where Thomas was very much modern. I think Thomas was an ancient cynic. You know what cynicism does? And that's what our culture is all about today why we don't have happy endings in our movies anymore, because that's corny. 
according to cynicism? Because we all know life doesn't work like that, right? Cynicism says I can remain aloof, and that's how I'm going to protect myself. I'm not going to give my heart fully to anybody, and I'm certainly not going to bow the knee to a God I can't see. I can't believe in stories like that. And at the heart of all of that, isn't there the fear of being let down? Haven't you been let down in your life? Loved ones, friends, family, church, letting you down. And eventually, you begin to develop kind of a a skin around your soul saying, I'm not going to be let down again. That's where I think Thomas was this week after the resurrection 2,000 years ago. He said, I'm not going to be let down. I've been let down plenty in my life. And that's why his skepticism was resolute. And then there's the contrast in this passage. Jesus comes to pronounce a benediction. That last part of this passage, did you notice, it begins and ends with a blessing. Notice he appears upon, among them, verse 26, and says, peace be with you. He had said that prior to them, prior, a week earlier, when he first appeared. And you have to understand something about the culture here. The Greek word Jesus uses translates a Hebrew word that some of you may know, shalom. Now, we tend to think of peace as like the cessation of hostilities. Like we pray for peace when there's war going on. We mean the fighting stops. And that's what the Hebrew word means and the Greek word Jesus is using. But it means something more than that in the Old Testament. Shalom means wholeness. Everything integrated. Everything the way it's supposed to be. The kingdom of God come on earth everything right. The best day you've ever had forever. That's what it means. And so as Jesus appears among them again, he pronounces this blessing and says, it's not just this pronouncement right now. It's a promise of what's coming in the future that's been guaranteed by my resurrection. It's not an empty promise. Jesus doesn't come and just say, peace. He says, no, no, no. It's going to happen because the tomb is empty. And then there's a detail here that's so easy to miss. He gives them this greeting, and then he addresses Thomas. He was not in the room when Thomas said, unless I see, I won't believe. He wasn't there. And yet he knows exactly what Thomas said. He wasn't eavesdropping outside. He didn't have his ear pressed against the door so he could impress his disciples. No, the Greek verb here makes it clear that he appeared. He just appeared in front of them. How do you know what Thomas said? Well, precisely because of what Thomas is going to say. Because he's God in the flesh. He's the maker. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. He knows all things. He controls all things. He knows exhaustively because he controls completely, and he controls completely because he knows exhaustively. He's the all-knowing one, the all-seeing one, come in the flesh, raised from the dead. That's how he knew what Thomas said. And this is where it gets really interesting, doesn't it? Because what did Jesus have every right to do to Thomas as the crown king of the universe. The Bible never commends skepticism. If you remember back, if you were here during Christmas time, we talked about when this miracle of uh, Elizabeth having a child in her older age was announced. Zechariah, Zechariah rather, was was saying, well, I don't believe that. And the angel says, you're going to be silent for seven months, or for nine months, rather. Unbelief is not commended. But here's the good news, friends. The gospel is designed for skeptics like us. Because Jesus could have come and said, Thomas, I gave you every opportunity. You've seen it all. Away with you. He would have done that. He could have done that, and it would have been well within his rights to do so. 
But he's not expected, is he? He's an unexpected savior. And instead of rebuking his unbelief and scolding him, he condescends in kindness and patience with him. That's such good news, especially if you're a skeptic this morning. If you meet Jesus, he's not going to come at you scolding you like a parent whom you've wronged. That's not how he works. He's patient. He's kind with our unbelief. He's patient and he's kind with our stubbornness. Aren't you thankful for that? This is who he is. And what does he say to Thomas? I, I've always wondered what the tone of voice would have been like. He says, Thomas, put your hands here at my side. Place them in my wounds. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And here's something else that's easy to skip over. There's no record, no indication that Thomas actually touched him. The text doesn't tell us that. It seems rather that Thomas, as soon as he saw Jesus, as soon as he heard the kindness of Christ to him, fell down and worshiped. And that teaches us about what needs to happen when we meet Jesus, doesn't it? It teaches us a few things about what needs to happen. We need to confess what Thomas confessed, that Jesus is God. What did he say when he fell down before him and worshiped? My Lord and my God. And we need to have a little bit more context here. This word Lord in the original, remember where we are in world history? The Jewish people of this time had a Greek translation of the Old Testament known as the Septuagint, named from the Greek term for 70, or the Latin term for 70, rather, for, for 70 scholars that put together this Greek version of the Old Testament. That's what these people would have grown up hearing in the synagogue. That's what they read in the synagogue. And over 3,000 times in the Old Testament, God, the living God, the maker of heaven and earth, the redeemer of Israel, refers to himself as Lord. Your English Bibles have this. My Lord and my God, the Lord your God says all over the place in the Old Testament. So that when Thomas says, my Lord and my God, as a faithful Jew, everybody in there knew what he was saying. He was saying, you, Jesus, are Yahweh in the flesh, the covenant God of Israel, the maker of the universe. You are him in the flesh. That's where we got to start. Jesus never meant for us to have the option of just saying, you're a really nice guy. Or, you had the best moral teaching in the history of mankind. Or, you're a good religious teacher like Buddha. You might help us find some enlightenment. Jesus never wanted us to have those options, friends. He himself rang the division bell when he said earlier to his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. So there's only two options. You'll either fall down and worship or you'll walk away. So you gotta confess he's Lord and you gotta do what Thomas did. That skepticism that he woke up with that morning disappears like the morning mist after a sunrise. And whole-souled, wholehearted, knee-bowing, life-dedicating worship followed. That's all that can happen when you meet the risen Lord. As one author said, if the resurrection isn't true, that changes everything. But if the resurrection is true, and it is, that changes everything. In other words, you can't remain neutral about this. You're either going to fall on your face in worship like Thomas did, 
or you're going to go back to where Thomas was before Jesus entered that room. And then he closes with what I think is one of the most amazing promises in all the Bible. And there's some ambiguity here in the original. If you've got an English translation here, it says a question. Have you believed because you've seen me? That's a good translation. The problem is in the original, you can't tell if it's like a gentle rebuke or a question. There's no question marks in Greek. It's all just big letters running together, and so you learn to discern where the breaks come. We enter those question marks, and there's pretty easy to tell when it's a definite question. That's not the case here. It's ambiguous, I think, on purpose because I think Jesus is both gently reminding Thomas and asking all of us this question because he knew we'd read it. Is this the reason why, Thomas? Because you've seen. That's why you believe. No, no, he says. And he gives us a benediction. He doesn't say this often. He preached something called the Sermon on the Mount. You read about it in Matthew 5. He opens with what are called the Beatitudes. Each one begins with this same word, blessed. He doesn't say that often outside of the Beatitudes. So we need to pay attention when he does. He's saying, blessed, benediction resting upon those who have not seen and yet believed. I want you to think about that, friends. Thomas got to see the light in Jesus' eyes every morning. He got to walk with him. He shared meals with him. Jesus would maybe tear off a piece of pita bread and hand it to him over supper while they were ministering together. For the rest of his natural life, Thomas when he closed his eyes, could call to mind what Jesus' smile looked like, what his handshake felt like, what it felt like when Jesus dipped down into that wash basin and took water that he created and sustained and placed it lovingly upon Thomas' feet. Those memories never left him. For all of his life, Thomas had what we all think we would want in order to have true faith, and that is seeing Jesus up close and personal, and Jesus turns that on its head. He says, you and me on Easter in 2024 are in a better position than Thomas was with the risen Lord in person 2,000 years ago that second Easter. Think about that. He says, we're in a better position to believe because he's giving us the heart of what biblical religion is. We tend to think and we tend to be impressed by the spectacular that engages our senses. The Bible doesn't do that. Miracles are almost like an afterthought. You ever notice that? If you read through the Gospels, Jesus does this miracle that we would want a whole lot more information on, and it's like a sidebar. Oh yeah, of course he did that. He's Jesus. Now pay attention to this. That's how the New Testament reads. Of course he did this. And that's how the whole Bible reads. Because as one of the old Puritans put it, biblical religion is a religion of the ear gate, not the eye gate. It's a religion of hearing. You hear and believe. And this is why Jesus gives us this benediction which should give us so much hope. You don't have to see him to believe him. Seeing is not believing. Thomas saw it all. Jesus condescended to him and he will be gentle with you, my dear friend. But Jesus says, Blessed are you when you don't see and you still believe and you take him at his word. So what does all this mean as we go back out into the real world? Let me say a couple things as we finish. We come back to our original problem is seeing, believing. That was our question. See, Jesus' words here invite us to a, to a new 
better reality. It's just the opposite of what we've been told. And if you want the first benediction of this passage, peace, wholeness, shalom, you have to accept the second benediction of this passage. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Can't have the one without the other. You looking for peace? You looking for wholeness? Do you feel the brokenness of this world? That anthem we just heard, love that song by Andrew Peterson, is he worthy? Do you feel all creation groaning? Don't you feel it? Don't you feel the brokenness of this world? The injustice, the heartache? Look at your own life. When's the last time you were at peace? And Jesus offers that, and the condition is the greatest and most kind condition you could ever want to have peace. He says, just trust me. Not work your way back to me, not do all these things, and then I'll save you, and you'll make yourself savable. No, 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 no. Just, just, just hear me and believe me. That's what he says over and over again. And that's the hardest part for us, isn't it? We want to see. And Jesus says, you can see me. You can. But only with the eyes of faith. And that's the best sight there is, my friends. That's reality. What does Paul say? The things that are seen are temporary. But the things that are unseen, are eternal and real. This is not the real world. Not in a matrix sense. That was a movie that was made in the early 2000s. Not in that sense, but that all of this is fleeting. And you know it, and I know it, and we feel it deeply. And Jesus says, I can give you peace. Just believe me. The last thing is this, that the gospel, the gospel of resurrection based around this historical fact is not just true, my friends. It's beautiful, isn't it? If you're a skeptic this morning and you may not be convinced by anything I've said, and that's okay, but you can't deny the beauty of what you read here. We want this to be true. You want a God like this running the universe, a God who will condescend and love you where you are but never leave you where you are, a God who comes and appears to people who've betrayed him, left him in his greatest hour of need and says, I love you. He'll say the same to you and to me. And think about the world Thomas woke up in that morning. It's the world we live in right now. Wars, rumors of wars, relational strife, financial difficulties. And the resurrection is the promise that the world that Thomas woke up in is not the same world he went to sleep with that night, was it? No, he went to sleep in faith and knew, knew that the promise was real. We had the privilege of being down in Orlando with my brother and his family over spring break. And there was one of those nights, it was the evening, and that's where my mama spent her last days. My kids were in the pool laughing, splashing. I looked over and I saw my wife, I saw my brother and my sister-in-law, and it was one of those moments where the sun was just right. We've all had these moments in our lives, and you just don't want it to end. I wanted the golden sunshine to keep going. I wanted to hear the sway of palm trees, the laughter of children, and see the people I love, and I didn't want it to end. And we've all got those days. We've all got those moments. And for us, reality came crashing in when we left the foretaste of resurrection glory and entered the I think the modern equivalent of Dante's seventh circle of hell, Atlanta, at five o'clock on Friday. 
brought us crashing back to earth. You don't have to sit in Atlanta traffic, traffic to know that your best moments will end. And here's what the resurrection, the shalom Jesus promises gives us. The promise that is sealed by the reality of the resurrection. That those best days were never meant to end. That you were never meant to go to funerals. That your tear ducts were not meant to cry for loved ones that were lost. That death is an enemy. That God made us to want these things to last forever because he created them to last forever. And the resurrection proclaims to us, they will. They will. There's going to come a day, friends, when what was sealed by the unsealed tomb 2,000 years ago becomes reality. And what was partial, that breathing on the disciples, becomes the fullness of the Spirit indwelling the new heavens and the new earth. Will you be there? Will you be there when the best days never end? All you have to do is trust Him, believe Him, and leave here this morning and make the words of the old Easter hymn your own. Let them be your own creed on this resurrection. Here's how it went. No more we doubt thee. No more we doubt thee, glorious prince of life. Life is not without thee. Aid us in our strife. Make us more than conquerors through thy deathless love. Bring us safe through Jordan to thy home above. Thine be victory, risen, conquering Son. Endless is the victory. Thou or death has won. Let's pray. Father, you know we struggle to believe this. So thank you for giving us a story, a historical account to help us believe in our weakness. Thank you for being a patient Savior, Jesus. Thank you for being a loving, kind Savior. Even today, in 2024, it can be like Easter in A.D. 1, as it were. Easter in A.D. 33. Easter every day since then, where the new creation has come and the old is passing away. Oh, Lord, come quickly. We pray in your mighty name. Amen.